Celebrating 12 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Daedra Charles Furlow. Welcome to another edition of Anything is Possible. I'm Halloran Hilton Hill. Great stories about great people who prove with their lives that anything is possible. And yes, we do have a new set, courtesy of our friends at Nouveau Classics. And I have another story, dynamic story of possibility. Meet this young lady from Detroit, Michigan, <laughs> Deidre Charles Furlow. Thank you for being here today. Absolutely, my pleasure. We found out we're from the same hometown. I know, right? <laughs> Born in the same, same hospital. hospital. Absolutely. That's pretty cool. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Prop 48, what does that mean? Well, back in 1987, um, as part of the entrance exam, the ACT and SAT, and I failed it by one point. And so what that meant was that I was still allowed to go to the University of Tennessee, but I had to sit out for a year. And I only had three years of eligibility. When, when you found that out, how did that make you feel? Because uh, first of all, to come to the University of Tennessee, to play for a legend in a legendary program. First of all, it's not guaranteed you're gonna get to play anyway. <laughs> right. right. But to come here, how did that feel to have to sit a year? Because see, I, I didn't know that about you. We were talking before we started the interview, and you said, Halloran, I only had three years to get it done, and I'm playing intramurals, and I'm playing running by myself. What was going through your head? Well, initially, I was devastated. Um, I had never faced any adversity like that. I've always played in high school four years, and grade school for three years, and... Um, Dominant, too. Yeah. <laughs> I love that little smile you did right there because you're trying to hold it back, but you're ready to play tonight. <laughs> yeah, if I could, these bad knees. But it was devastating, and um, I had to sit out, and I could not be a part or be around the team, like any exercising, uh, practices. I mean, I had no um, involvement with them unless we were outside of the gym. And so it was really hard because I had to sit out and I had to watch my teammates play the game that I love and I had to watch it from the seat in the arena. Right, and all the time they're gelling as a team. The positions are getting fixed and defined. So that makes it even harder to figure out, are you going to have a place and a space in a Pat Summit team, which is a well-oiled machine? So. What happened when you finally got to break on that court? Well, I'm telling you, I was so excited to be around my teammates in that capacity. Um, it was it was natural for me to be out there just being a leader. Um, Bridget Gordon was the senior and Melissa McCray and uh, Sheila Frost. So we had great leaderships and all I had to do is just come in and play. There was no big expectation or I didn't try to do more than what you know was expected of me at that time I just went out there just to play but I was excited to finally get on the floor you remember the first time you played first big game home game oh my goodness all of them was big <laughs> everybody's game every time we played anybody that was a big game I mean everybody was gunning after Tennessee we had the big bullseye on our back so every game was a big Everybody game. played their best against you. Absolutely. Had you ever been pushed that hard in your life? I think I've been pushed, but when I got to the University of Tennessee, it does a, a totally different level. Um, Pat Summit knows how to push your buttons. Either you like her or you don't. And I happened to really like her, but at the time, some of the things we were going through, I'm like, she gotta be crazy. Why is she yelling? Why is this? Give me one example of something where you were just like, this is nuts. Well, I didn't sprint the floor, okay? And then um, on the way back, <clears throat> down on offense, uh, she was mad because I didn't go to the offensive boards. Well, at least I thought I went, but when I watched the film and I saw how bad that I didn't sprint, I didn't try to box out, I wasn't anticipating when the shot went up, and she just was yelling, we wouldn't be in this situation if you would get your butt out there and rebound. I'm like, but I am. I mean, I'm playing defense. I'm trying to score. You tr you want me to do everything? But she expected once you took the floor that there was no excuses. You play hard or you come out. 
Mm. And she made me sit down. Wow. Yeah. Uh, my guest is Deidre Charles Furlow. Uh, her number is hanging now. It's been retired, so we'll get to that story. And she's another person that proves that anything is possible. More coming up in just a moment. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. And that whole weekend went by me not knowing is it positive or is it negative. I got a call on Monday morning at 8.30 and my world changed drastically. Your eyes light up when you talk about basketball. I mean, right now, I mean, you get fidgety in the chair. You just, what is that energy I see? You know, I just love the game of basketball, and I wish I could still compete now. If I could get into a, um, a 40 over league, I really would, but my knees just won't let me. It's just, I love the the physicalness of it. I love for someone to try to stop me, you know, because I know they can't stop me. That's just my attitude. And I love to rebound. I love to box out. Um, and I just, I love the physical play and I love being around my team. We had such a unique team, team mates that really cared about each other. And that's what really made being at the University of Tennessee really special. Team. All right, so let's look at your career. You set records. <laughs> National championship, SEC championship, uh, rebounding, uh, you scored over 1,400 po points. And remember, we had to do this in three years. Played so strong, so hard that they retired your number, and that rarely happens. You played in Italy, you played in Japan, you played in L.A. professionally. You went to the Olympics, snagged a, a bronze medal there. Um, you coached. You tutored players, you coached at Auburn, and now you are a coach right now. And the stuff that used to think Pat Summit was crazy about, you have to have moments where you are coaching these young women and you find yourself acting every bit as crazy. <laughs> You're right, I find myself saying a lot of the same things that she would say. You know, it's always about the little things. Don't cheat. You know, always you want to anticipate. You want to make sure that <clears throat> you're giving your all. You know, if you get tired, pull your shirt. That was one of her rules. Don't get, don't Ooh, put your hands. Does, what does that mean, pull your shirt? You pull your jersey like this to signal to the bench, I'm tired. And she will get us out the game. Hmm. That's a whole life metaphor right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, keep going now. Um, and so I just... You know, I enjoy teaching these young ladies, and I know sometimes they look at me like, she don't know, what, what is she talking about? But I tell them, trust what I'm saying, because I was in the same situation as you. I said, the only thing that I didn't do is I didn't get an attitude when my coach talked to me, and I didn't talk back. I always believe whether I really thought it or not, I always did what she asked me to do. And that's what I'm trying to get my kids to understand, is that, it's how you lose. We can lose every game, but how are we going to lose? Are we just going to lay down or are we going to fight? Are we going to try to get better? Even if we lose, we can still do some really, really good things even after that loss. We, we can learn what we did wrong and how we can adjust. It's about adjustment. So I don't know. I just, I, I love to coach them and I just, it's a pleasure for me to be at West High School. You know what? I, that's where I saw you at West High School and I saw you talking to the young people and um, when I when I shook your hand, I just your personality is just so vibrant. I mean, it's just you have a beautiful smile. You have a very winsome attitude, and but at the same time, I know you would box me out. That's right. <laughs> Don't bring it in here <laughs> with a smile. What your smile did not let me know. I had no idea that you were a cancer survivor. None. Not a trace, not a, not a, there was nothing about you that said you'd been through that, that you're still dealing with it. Not even sitting here right now. Cancer. 2009, routine mammogram, and uh, I went in and the lady uh, technician said, hey, the doctor would like to speak with you after we did the test. 
And I was nervous, my palms were sweating like I was getting ready to play a basketball game. She asked me to come in. She said, I see something that I don't like. Is there any way you can do a biopsy today? And I told her, absolutely. Because normally it doesn't happen that quickly. Right. So we did the biopsy. Mind you, that weekend, I'm a coach at UT. I'm the recruiting coordinator. We had a whole group of recruits coming in. So that Thursday is when I went. Friday, we had our kids come in. So I had to put on my game face and not think about myself. And that whole weekend went by me not knowing is it positive or is it negative. I got a call on Monday morning at 8.30 and my world changed drastically. What'd they say on that phone call? I wish she would have called me in, but she said, I'm sorry, it's positive. You have breast cancer. Someone will contact you a little bit later on today. Is, is, is this the number we can call you at? And I was like, absolutely. Got a call at about five o'clock saying, hey, can you get over here? We want to do a treatment plan for you. Went over, saw Dr. John Bell, which I love him. My team of doctors were great over at UT Medical. There and go, there goes that team again. Oh yeah, I had a great team of doctors, Dr. Hunsinger, um, Dr. Um, Patella. I mean, just really, really great doctors that really wanted to do what I thought was gonna be best for me. They gave me their suggestions, but they said, ultimately, it's up to you. And they put a game plan together, they executed it, and then I had to do my part. What, what did the game plan include? Did well, you have to have chemo or did you choose radiation? <coughs> what did you do? Did you have to have a mastectomy? How did it work out? Well, I didn't do a mastectomy. I did a partial mastectomy um, because the numbers and odds that were given to me, I felt that that would be sufficient for me. And if it was to ever come back, then I would just remove both. Um, and then he said that it would be better if you do chemo and radiation. And when he gave me all the numbers, the statistics, and all of that, and I still have the plan that he drew up, um, I said, okay, well, let's, let's get it going. How, when can I have the surgery? You know, and so I had my surgery October the 24th, I mean 22nd, and I'm cancer-free. I'm barking up on five years in October, so I'm really excited about that. Change your perspective on life? Big time. How? Well, because you never, sometimes you just don't think it's going to happen to you. I mean, I, Melissa McCray Dukes, one of my teammates, um, which was, she was crucial in helping me through this process. Actually, I told her first, and she came with me to all my appointments and stuff. But how it changed my life is never take anything for granted. It can happen to you, and it can happen in a second. And so I was just like, wow, I just thought I was going to die. But after a while, my perspective has started to change and I started feeling a little bit more comfortable with what was going on because you don't know, like, is it in the rest of my body? You know, is it going to attack? You know, you just don't know. And so I educated myself a little bit. I didn't read too much because you can read and your mind can take you places. But um, my doctors pretty much assured me that, you know what, we got this you're gonna be fine. And once I heard that, I started feeling a little bit better. Tell me about your friends, your family, your faith. Wow, well, I don't have a big circle of friends um, and I like it that way. Mm -hmm. um, it's just easier. Um, my family, we're very close. Um, me, my mom and my sister, my sister's four years older than me. And um, I have a son, Anthony Charles Furlow. And I am still married to my husband, Anthony. Um, Does your son play basketball? Oh, he tries. Gotcha. He thinks he can beat his mama, but. Mm -mm. Not gonna happen. Oh, no. Not at all. <laughs> I take me some Advil, I lace it, <laughs> put on my sleeves, and we can only get one game in half court, mind you. Um, but yeah, no, he's 14, and he goes to Bearden um, High School, and he's doing quite well. He doesn't play on the team there, but he plays. But he's a really good teacher. Um, he comes and helped me with my kids at West and they just love him. They, they, they all just, I don't know, they like a big family. Um, and my faith, I mean, I know that if it wasn't, you know, for God, I, I wouldn't be here at all. And um, I'm a Christian and I go to um, Payne Baptist 
uh, church, and you know I try to get there as much as I can. Deidre Charles Furlow, uh, I'll just call her homegirl since we're from <laughs> Detroit, is my guest. We'll be right back. Coming up. She says, so don't tell me that you, you, you can't do this or this is too hard. You can do anything you want to do. And then Pat reinforced that same thing. You can be anything you want to be. The sky's the limit. This week, our Home Federal Bank Community Spotlight is on the Second Harvest Food Bank of East Tennessee. Did you know that the Second Harvest Food Bank has been fighting hunger in our region since 1982? 12 million meals, 170,000 people each month. To learn more and see how you can get involved, visit secondharvestetn.org. Deidre Charles Furlow is my guest on Anything is Possible. Man, it's great having you here. Just got joy having you here today. Oh, well, thank you. What have you learned about possibility? Um, what has life taught you? What a, how do you take a dream and turn it into reality? I know you like to have a game plan. I mean, you <laughs> talked about doing what it takes embracing the process when you were being coached and as a coach you have to have a game plan and when your doctors went to work to get that breast cancer out of you they gave you a plan you still have that plan so it seems like having a plan is is vital and important to you right well you have to have goals and I set goals for myself um, I wanted to be an Olympian I wanted to be an All-American I wanted to have the opportunity to win a national championship I wanted to be the best player to come out of college basketball. And in order for all of those things to happen, because they happen, I had to work extremely hard. I mm -hmm. had to push myself, even when I didn't want to do it. You know, it was easy, you know, easy to say, hey, you know, I'm not gonna go today and I'm gonna take the day off and just get into that pattern. But I pushed myself. I had great people around me who pushed me as well mm -hmm. um, when I would go and work out. Cause it's hard to work out by yourself. You know what I'm saying? Cause you don't probably go as hard, but when you have a group of people that's working and gunning for the same thing you're gonna, it makes it a lot easier for you to train because now you start competing against each other. So, I mean, anything is possible if you put your mind to it, if you believe it, you can achieve it. And I'm just one of those types of people that when I want something, I go after it. Where, where do you think that drive comes from? Well, first, my mom. What's she like? Oh, my mom is funny. I mean, my mom is one of my biggest supporters. She never missed a high school game, and she would come to as many of my collegiate games as she could. Um, but she would always say to me, Deidre, you can do anything you want to do. She said, you know how you know all these rap songs and stuff? You, you can do your schoolwork the same way. And I'm like, but it's not the same. She said, oh, no, yes, it's it the is same the same. Thing. She said, this stuff you learned in basketball, she said, I, I can't tell you what a screen or pick is. She said, you just picked it up. She said, so don't tell me that you, you, you can't do this or this is too hard. You can do anything you want to do. And then Pat reinforced that same thing. You can be anything you want to be. The sky's the limit. It's all about how hard are you going to work? And, you know, are you going to be disciplined in your actions? Are you going to be dedicated to what you're doing? And do you have the desire to do it? Hmm. I'm just soaking that up. That's, that is so vital and so true. What about your dad? My dad, he worked in the auto industry for 35 years at Ford Motor Company, and my parents were divorced when, um, when I was 12. He was still in the picture, but, you know, not quite right. as much, but um, would still call him, and, you know, he would come and see me, you know, at school and stuff like that. And we're close, but not as close as me and my mom, though. It's always been the three amigos. Do you find yourself acting like your mother some now? With my son? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because I tell my son the same thing. He know every song on the radio. And I'm like, but you're struggling in math. Why is that? I said, because you're not practicing your math, are you? He's like, well, Mom, I'm doing better. Yeah, you are doing better. But if you would learn that math like you learn that song, I said, you would be getting all A's. Isn't it amazing how all this stuff, you find yourself on the court coaching, saying stuff Pat was saying, and you find yourself with your son bringing it back full circle. Do you want to coach at the collegiate level again? I do. I would love to go back and, and coach, but I'm having a great time with these young ladies now. 
um, just remind me a lot of uh, where I need to be and I, I still got a, a lot that I'm learning as well on how to effectively communicate with this generation because it is totally different from the college level to the high school. It, it's, it's just totally different. You know what I just, what just dawned on me is the perfect, perfect preparation for going back to coaching at the collegiate level is the high school level. Because mm -hmm. these are the people you're going to be recruiting. Exactly. And you will know how they think. Exactly. You will know how they are. They want what they want when they want it, but they don't always want to give. Mm. Wow. Well, I think you have an amazing story, and I think you have a, an amazing story of possibility, but I think you are an amazing possibility. You radiate um, a joy. You radiate a, a positive leaning toward life. Um, you look like the song, Happy. <laughs> And uh, I, just, I just pray that God blesses you in everything you touch and everything you do. Because I guess the most amazing thing that you get to do on a daily basis is with these young women, you get to deposit into their lives that belief that they can do things, that anything is possible. And they may not understand it now, right? They may just tr try to figure out how to get something up on Instagram. Oh, <laughs> well, they know how to do that. Right. <laughs> But thank you for, for not allowing your talents and your gifts to be lost, that you're investing them in young people. That is a beautiful thing. And uh, I appreciate you, and thank you for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. Because you are, you are a toast to the fact that anything is possible. Thank you for being here. Thank you.